IT at, oh, this meeting is being recorded. It is, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a pop-up so, then. Um, I forgot to put that on. So, yeah, ended up teaching IT at uh, college and um, taught literally everything from, this is a mouse, see the, the cursor move on the screen, up to uh, degree level networking and IT technologies. Um, but found that I, I wasn't really well suited to the education environment and uh, went self-employed. Uh, so now I spend my time helping small businesses with their technology, just making sure that things work, showing them how to use things, making sure they're using the right things and using them the right way. Technology is supposed to be your friend. It is supposed to be there to help you make your life easier. Um, I'm the guy who does that for you. I make it work. And you're based in um, Plymouth, aren't you? I'm based in but, Plymouth, but, uh, but you don't with this new work. frame of technology, I can go anywhere. Exactly. And that's what we got to be doing these days anyway. Most of us have got to find a way to just work anyway. How about you, Phil? Well, Linda knows me uh, quite well. Um, but I, I have a corporate retail background originally, uh, but for the last 15 years before I retired, which was three years ago, I was a small business advisor in Exeter. I did all the small business work for the city, city council. And Linda and I had lots of uh, working sessions together. And also Linda joined um, an initiative of mine, which I started two years before I retired called IY, which is a coaching club. And I used to run a monthly coaching event for um, small businesses, coaches, people wanting to develop their business and network. Um, Subsequent to that, I didn't keep that going. I couldn't get enough people to subscribe as members. So uh, subsequent to that, uh, and I've always had a, an interest in uh, energy medicine, alternative health, complementary medicine. I trained as a homeopath, practiced as a homeopath for six or seven years. So I've gone back to that, and I now have a, an online um, practice uh, called Vital Forces, which actually works with the intuitive side of the brain. And I now do readings for people, and I'm launching a I Ching for Business uh, service um, in the next few days. Great. I look forward to seeing and hearing more about that. Thank, Thank you, you, Linda. Nice to see you, Linda. Phil has been very helpful to me, and I, I'm for the life of me, I just can't work out why that networking thing that you started didn't work. But these days, you know, it seems to be a bit tough trying to get people to understand that you have something that's helpful to them. Yeah. You know, so You've always anyway. been a great support, Linda. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, Derek. Hello. Um, yeah, still doing a lot of what I've done for years um, in the um, healthcare, life insurances, wills, powers of attorney. But um, like Phil, for donkey's years, I've done alternative medicines and doing a lot more because there's a lot more stuff coming out now, which especially with the way people's health is going is going to be needed drastically because everything now if you look and especially at the youngsters and the problems they're getting with their health is getting ridiculous and a lot of it is brought on dare I say by people making money from what they give them and um, even what they wear it was quite interesting I was in a shop the other day and I saw a can of a spray for the garden called Roundup and in big letters on the front of it, it said, no glyphosate. <laughs> now, glyphosate is Roundup. Yeah. And I know the problems it can cause, to, apart from the data I've had from various universities that have tested it. Because when it first came out, I was working in biotechnology and agriculture. And I used it. Very efficient. But within five months... Everywhere I sprayed on a certain farm I used to shoot on, every rabbit I shot had tumours in it. Yeah. So it was left under no doubt, and they love eating bramble shoots. And there is so much like that now. It's no that, coincidence, uh, is it, that Monsanto has been bought by Merck because Monsanto's name has become so tarnished. Why? It's dis disappeared as a brand, right? Yes. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. So, uh, yes, and as I say, a lot of new things coming out now. And when we were in agriculture, I was doing agriculture and knew a lot of the problems that were happening. Um, a, with the way crops and animals were being raised and the nutrition that was going from the soil 
in 92, the World Health Organization did a worldwide survey on soils. America was 82% deficient in minerals. Europe was 72. So for donkey years, people have not been eating what they need that their bodies were designed to want when we came out of caves. Yeah, absolutely right. So now well, with the... Why yeah. were you there, Derek? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we'll, we'll get going then, because um, time is marching on. So Grant, of course, you with Bright. We have a, a Sharon Roberts with us as well. Yes, oh, sorry, I do apologize. Sharon, I don't know if you wanted to mention um, about who you are and anything that you wanted to share with us for the time. Uh, I'm just happy to listen, really. Um, I'm Sharon Roberts. I'm marketing manager for Simpkins Edwards, who are chartered accountants. So I just thought I'd have a little listen and see what it's all about, really. <laughs> okay, lovely. Thank you, Sharon. I do apologise. Sometimes you, you don't see the face and you think, oh, you know, they're not there. But thank you for joining us. We appreciate that. And so we'll get on uh, to Grant, of course, Philip Sewell. He's from Vitology and he's going to give us his tips, tech tips, and talk about the dark web. So welcome that. Uh, yep. Yeah. So sometimes in these networking events, uh, people are asked, you know, can you mute yourself during the presentation? Um, there's not many of us quite happy for you to stay unmuted. If you've got a question, chip in. Um, I, uh, you may have seen that I've got Brightology tablet has joined this meeting as well. When I start the presentation, I can't see you on the main screens, um, but I can see you on the tablet. So uh, if I, if any of you, um, well, I'm afraid not you, Linda, because I can only see two people at a time on here. So uh, Phil or Derek, if you've got any questions, just chip in, uh, wave your hand, something like that, uh, or speak up and I will uh, answer your question. So should we get going? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Uh, can you see my screen? Is it nice and big? No. Yes, can. Yeah, I can right. see the screen, all right. Yeah. Okay, and my presentation, I've got too many things open here. Where is my presentation? There it is. Excellent. So, top tech and tools for today's traders. Um, followed by, what the hell is the dark web later on? Uh, so, first of all, what and why? When I first started out in business, uh, I had lots of people saying, oh, you, what you need to do is you need to find an expert and let them do what you do at. So you can concentrate on what you are good at. And I think we'd all agree that that is actually really good advice. But for new businesses and for some small businesses, it's not very practical advice. Um, indeed, I actually had uh, one guy, bear in mind, this was my first year of trading. Uh, recommend that I go and get myself a cleaner to do the, the cleaning of my house, you know, the general chores, so that I can spend more time and effort on my own business. And he didn't seem to grasp the idea of the fact that, yes, that makes perfectly good sense, logically, but until I have an income that can sustain that, that's an expense, that's not an investment. It's only an investment if I can't you know, if I, I absolutely need that time. Uh, in fact, I was having a discussion with a guy online the other day uh, who was making a very similar point. Uh, you know, you need to, he gets a cleaner. Uh, actually, no, what was his? He gets somebody to do the ironing for him um, uh, because he's like a hundred pound an hour, and it's 20 pound an hour. And if it takes him an hour to do the ironing, that's a hundred pound he's wasted. So he's, he's 80 quid up fantastic but he then went on to say that he only works in his business for eight hours a day okay so why not do the ironing outside of your business hours otherwise you're just spending money so um it swings and roundabouts anyway so what this all came about was i decided that i would start teaching people how to do various bits for themselves with a little bit of direction um so pointing in the right direction, giving you some tools and some tech tips, and you can actually get an awful lot done yourself without necessarily having to spend frivolously um, on other things. So um, most businesses go through several stages of development from startup onwards. This is aimed primarily at phase one businesses, but 
There are plenty of bits in here that apply to everyone, regardless of what stage you're in. Okay, things that you may not have thought about, things that haven't occurred to you before. Stock advice that finding someone else still stands. I have an accountant. I don't like doing my accounts. It is more efficient for him to do it than me. So yeah, absolutely still, if you can, get someone to do it for you. But only if it is necessary. All right, so what we're going to look at here. Quite a list there. Pictures, business cards, domain names, websites, emails, calendars, uh, drives, so storage systems, messaging platforms, uh, con uh, contact lists, to-do tools, uh, using mapping software, uh, things to do with phones and answering services, um, spam, uh, social payment stuff, uh, CRMs, accounting features, uh, and a couple of other bits there. Uh, mammoth memory, I can't remember what I was going to say about that one. So without further ado, pictures. Do not download other people's work without permission. It's quite straightforward, but you'd be surprised the number of people that go, well, I found this picture on Google. Just because it's on Google doesn't mean it's available for you to use it. There are some places, however, that provide images with a license that says, yeah, you can use this image, do whatever the hell you like with it, I don't care. So places that I typically get images from, uh, open clip art, uh, as the name suggests, it's all clip art related. I would caveat that they have had a few problems over the last couple of years, um, mainly with people hacking them um, and attacking their DNS servers and stuff, which we can cover later. Uh, at the moment, they do have a lot of artwork on there, but it's not searchable. So if you want to click through 4,000 pages, each with 100 images on it, be my guest. However, about 95% of the Open Clip Art archive is available on Pixabay, so, uh, which is searchable. So I would recommend for the time being, be aware of Open Clip Art, but don't use it. Stick with Pixabay, Pexels, uh, free images and more file. Um, Pixabay and Pexels are stock photos. So you may have heard of um, iStock images and uh, Shutterstock and places like that. Pixabay and Pexels, they give you images of same quality and the license is, use them. We don't care, do what you want with them. So if you are looking for images for uh, sharing on social media, you can get stuff from Pixabay. You can then edit them in your favorite image editing program, be that Photoshop or Canva or whatever. Put your information over the top of them, do whatever you want with them, but it's free. There is no price tag to them. Morg file is an odd one here. Um, Morg file is genuine stock clip, uh, photos, but they're the ones that the photographer has deemed that they're not good enough. They might go and take uh, 20 or 30 photos of, um, let's say, the Golden Gate Bridge. And maybe one or two of those he will uh, send or sell through um, Shutterstock. The others are probably still bloody good photos, but being a photographer and a bit of a, um, I've forgotten the word now, wants everything to be perfect, he's not going to sell them through Shutterstock because they're not perfect. So he'll put them on the morgue file. So it's a really good place to find images that are good, but they're not quite the same as the ones that you'd find on Shutterstock. I hope that will make sense, but certainly, Go and use these places. The two I use most are Pixabay and Pexels. They've got a massive, massive um, database of photos and videos and clip art. So business cards. This is the bit where um, I frequently, if I'm doing this presentation to uh, a room of people at a networking event, uh, I get people um, a bit shocked by this and sometimes puts people's backs up designing your own. It annoys a lot of designers when I say that. The point is consider it. Just because you're not a designer doesn't mean you don't have an idea of what you're looking for in a card. So if you've got um, just a bit of paper you can kind of scribble out an idea of what you want. If you've got some 
image editing software, even Canva, you can move things around and have an idea of what it is you're looking for. Don't print them on your own printer. Even if you've got one of these uh, card printing things that you can pick up from Staples, the quality is appalling. And more often than not, uh, as it goes through the printer, it starts to get a millimetre, two millimetres, three millimetres out. And you end up trimming the cards and they, they just look horrible. Don't do it. Um, standard cards are 85 by 54-ish. There are some variations there, but you'll find most business cards are um, essentially credit card size, and that's the size that you're looking for. Um, be bold with them. Don't necessarily clutter them. I've seen so many business cards where they have jammed on everything they possibly can onto the business card, and it just makes it difficult to read and difficult to follow. Um, you can get decent quality cards for as little as £16 plus VAT if you are prepared to do the artwork yourself. So places like Trade Print, which is where I get mine from mostly, um, if you supply them with a print-ready PDF, then that's it. It's £16 plus VAT for 500 cards, which is ridiculously cheap. Um, and in all honesty, most business card printers will actually outsource the printing uh, to someone else anyway. There's only about three or four places in the country that do actual business card printing. So if you order your cards from a particular printer and they come in uh, a, a box and it's, it's a, a black or grey box, chances are it's come from the same place as where I get mine from with shape, trade print. The only thing to bear in mind is with a print ready PDF, it has to be slightly bigger. So I've said 85 by 54, but it actually has to have three millimeter gap around the edges and little tick corner, tick marks in the corners that indicate where it is to be cut so that when it's cut, it comes down to 85 by 54. That is all a print ready PDF is. Slightly bigger than it needs to be with marks in the corners to tell them where to cut it. That's it. If you can do that and you can make it PDF, you can make an absolute saving. A lot of people poo-poo Vistaprint. You can actually get some pretty good um, quality stuff from Vistaprint as long as what you provide them is high quality in the first place. Where a lot of people fall down is Vistaprint is their first port call and you can just upload a JPEG and they will do it. They will print it off for you. But unfortunately, because what you've given them is fairly poor quality, what you end up with is fairly poor quality. If you give them a really good high quality image, what you get back out of them is also fairly good. But you actually tend to get better value for money from proper printers and proper print brokers rather than just going to Vistaprint. But that is an option there if you want it. Whew. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Good. Right, domains. This is a point of confusion for an awful lot of people. A domain name is not a website, but in order to have a website, you do need a domain name. A domain name is literally just the name. What you do with it is up to you. You can buy them for as little as a pound a year. Usually, if they are that cheap, they are on offer. But things like .eu domains are regularly pretty bloody cheap, to be honest with you. Um, averagely, .coms, .infos, .nets, the, the fairly standard uh, endings for a domain name are about £25 a year when they're not on sale. I would suggest that you avoid domains that have hyphens in them unless it is absolutely necessary, and sometimes it is. Um, I had a friend in South Devon, in the sort of Paynton-ish area, who ran an accountancy firm. His accountancy was called DCCA Accountancy. If he didn't have a hyphen in there, then people would be typing in DCCAACC Accountancy. And it just gets confusing as to where, how many C's there are, how many A's and where it is. So sometimes having a hyphen is necessary, but for the most part, people will forget that there is a hyphen there in which case you won't be getting emails, they won't be landing on your website. It's better if you do absolutely need to have a hyphen, buy both, one with and one without, so that if people get it wrong, it still gets to you. Personally, I buy all my domains through 123reg, um, more out of habit than anything. I find that their system for 
buying domains and managing domains is really, really easy to use. Uh, they are absolutely ruthless on the upsell. So when you are buying a domain, if all you want is the domain itself, you don't want any hosting, you don't want an email with them, you do have to keep going through and say, clicking the no button over and over again, because they will upsell everything all the time. But once you get past that, they're a doddle to deal with. You can, of course, buy your domains from pretty much anyone. There is, however, a lot more domains out there than people are aware of. A lot of people know about .coms, .co.uk's. Uh, .com accounts for about 25% of all domains out there that have ever been registered. Some figures would say it's up to about 50%. Um, I've no idea how many domains there are for .co.uk. Um, but you can always buy domains from with other endings. Be creative, be different, find something else for yourself. Um, here is a quick list of the domains, uh, the endings for a domain. It's very small writing, so you may not be able to see it. But there's a lot of endings. You do not have to stick with .com and .co.uk. Right, websites. If you've got yourself a domain, you can get a website for yourself. What you need is hosting. You can get them freely in a number of places. Use with caution. Uh, a lot of the free stuff is either really bad quality. I mean, there is a place, uh, I think it's literally called free web hosting, where it costs you nothing, but it is unbelievably slow. Um, other places, um, like strikingly, you can have really good looking websites, but they won't be tied in with your domain unless you pay an arm and a leg for the privilege of doing it. So be, be cautious about these places that offer you free websites. You can get good hosting. It's good enough for about £25 a year. Um, I set up a lot of micro businesses with this, particularly uh, network marketers. Um, it's not fantastic hosting, it's good enough. You don't need your own server. You don't need necessarily to have uh, bleedingly fast everything if you're only gonna have three or four people visiting it a week. If you're having thousands and thousands visiting every hour, yes, you want to have significantly more um, power behind it. But for most micro businesses, you can get a 25 pound a year hosting is perfectly good enough. And you can always get upgrade and move later as your needs require it. WordPress confuses a lot of people. Um, there are two WordPresses, wordpress.com and wordpress.org. The software that runs wordpress.com is provided by the people who run wordpress.org. You are allowed to use the software for free if you have your own hosting. It's pretty often an absolute doll to add. Once you've got yourself your hosting, let's say for the £25 a year, um, literally, it's normally a one-click install. You click a button that says add WordPress and wait about 15 minutes and bish bash bosh, you've got a website. It's, it's WordPress. You can go and tweak it. Uh, you can do what you want with it. Strictly speaking, WordPress is a blog, um, but you can use it for static pages and to create a, a normal website as well if you want. This is where blogging comes in. So 70% of all self-hosted self websites are actually hand-coded. They are made manually by developers. Um, when I say self-hosted, I mean not Wix, not Weebly, not Strikingly, but places where you have your own hosting, so, which is most websites, to be honest with you. Of the remaining 30%, 20% are, are WordPress. So WordPress powers a huge amount of the internet. It is very, very well trusted. There are loads of um, add-ons for it and tweaks that you can make. Um, it's, it's one of the best uh, tools out there for people creating their own websites. Only about 10% accounts for everything else. So other blogging platforms that are not WordPress 
and other what's called a content management systems. Um, beauty of WordPress is because it is so well supported, there are apps for it everywhere. So you can have an app on your phone and an app on your tablet or iPad or whatever. So if you're out and about, you can post from anywhere. You do not have to be sat at your office computer in order to write something. So if you're out and you have a bout of inspiration, so Derek, let's say you're out and you see something um, about uh, something being glyco, gly what's it called? Glyphosate. Gly glyphosate free. Yes. Um, and you have a sudden inspiration that you can write a blog post about that. You can write it there and then on <clears> your phone, on your tablet, and save it the draft if you want, so that you can come back and tweak it later, rather than coming home. Oh, yes, Phil? Yeah, agree with everything you say. I've just put in a word for Wix. I'm with, my site's built on Wix, and um, they recently introduced uh, an app which is completely integrated with your website. So you can do the same thing. You can check how many people have visited your site, visited your blog, you can do posts on the app and it's all automatically synced to your site. So, um, yeah. Yeah, Wix, Wix, Wix and Weebly are good. Yeah. They're, and they are very, very easy to use. Yeah, they are. Um, yeah. One of the concerns that some people have with Wix and Weebly is essentially you have no control over it. If they decide at any one point that they're going to move all of their data from uh, EU servers, I think actually in the UK, our Wix and Weebly servers are in Dublin. Um, you have no control if they go, nah, we don't want to pay for the hosting in Dublin. We want to move them over to the States again. You have no control over that. All you have is you can say, well, I closed my account. You can't even download your website to put it on another hosting platform. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's a certain amount of vulnerability there. You're quite right. But then they would lose a hell of a lot of revenue if they lost all their subscri subscriptions, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's always a balancing act. There, yeah. there are pros and cons to both. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm personally in the um, WordPress camp, but I've got half a dozen clients that are uh, Weebly. I've only got two or three that are Wix. Um, a lot of people seem to find Weebly is easier to use than Wix. I'm, it doesn't really make a lot of difference to me. They're both draggy, droppy, point and clicky things. Uh, yeah. How are you spelling Weebly, sorry? Sorry? How do you spell Weebly? W-E-E-B-L-Y. Okay. Because I hadn't heard of that one before, but uh, that's that's okay. Sorry. Okay. <coughs> so, emails. Emails are of utmost importance. A lot of people do not realize just how important emails are. And I'll come to this in a minute. Um, possibly mention it again when we look at the dark web later. You've got a domain you possibly have a website, use an email address that ties in with it. If you've bought a domain of DerekHampson.com, why not have an email address of Derek at DerekHampson.com or Phil at PhilDeem.com or, or whatever you want. Um, you might already have a Gmail or a Hotmail or something like that. That doesn't mean you can't still use it. You can tie your email address in with your Gmail, your Hotmail, whatever. Um, and still use them. But the number of times I've seen, particularly builders, they've got really nice shiny vans, they've got all the things, they've got a website on there, and their email address is something or other, you know, 123 at hotmail.com. And you're sitting behind them in a traffic jam with your face in your hands going, why have you bought this domain if you're not going to use it properly? Most places where you can um, buy or build your own websites, your hosting providers will also provide email for you. Unfortunately, many of these, their email provision is stuck in the 90s, but that isn't such a problem. If you have, let's say, a Gmail address, you can still pull in your email from them and send your email via them. So you're handling it all from within your Gmail account, but no one needs to see it. It still comes in and goes out from your hosting provider. If, however, you want to use something uh, a bit better, you can, oh, sorry, I've just said you can fudge it with Gmail and Hotmail. So you can get dedicated email hosting for as little as 80 pence per user per month. You can have as many email addresses as you like, you pay for the people. So Phil, if you wanted to have um, info at, hello at, uh, contacts at, um, accounts at, 
fill at. As long as it's all going to one person, it's still only 80 pence per, per month. So, thank you. Zoho, 80 pence per account per month. You can set it up with POP and IMAP and SMTP, so you can use it on any of your devices easily enough. Um, they do have a dedicated email app that you can have on iPhones, Android, and tablets and stuff if you want. Office 365. Uh, actually, it's now called Microsoft 365. They have changed it. So Microsoft 365 Business Essentials is £3.80 per month. It's a lot more than just email hosting. Um, and it works absolutely flawlessly if you've already got uh, Microsoft Office and you've got Outlook in there. It works flawlessly with Outlook. Um, if you are using other tools, then it works fine calendars you get online storage you get um microsoft teams the new uh video conferencing stuff for three pound 80 a month me i'm with google i use g suite it's four pound 14 a month and just like office 365 it's a lot more than just email hosting so it's not necessarily expensive <coughs> oh one caveat if you are going to be using um, Zoho, yeah, sorry, just noticed this. If you are going to go down the Zoho route, when you sign up, make sure that you are signing up to Zoho.eu. If you sign up to Zoho.com, you may end up actually with your emails being hosted in America or more likely in India. And you end up with a, a Zoho.in account. So be careful when you sign up that you are signing up from zoho.eu. Right, calendars. Use multiple calendars, use them for everything. I used to try and live my life with a paper calendar, but I ended up forgetting to take it with me. I ended up uh, not being bothered to find the appropriate day or time and I just write something on a sticky note and then completely forget to go and actually put it in the paper calendar, paper diary. So I, I am now very much an online calendar kind of person. I have my calendar on my phone, on my tablet, on my laptop, on my uh, desktop computers, everything. It's the same calendar everywhere. Um, I have one calendar for business purposes, one for personal, and one for pretty much everything else. Um, you can share calendars with others. So I have my calendar shared with my wife. Her calendars are shared with me and selectively our calendars are shared with our daughter and we can see hers. So we can all just see what everyone else is up to. The beauty of being able to share your calendar is you can also integrate it with um, so-called book yourself in systems. So for instance, I could send you Derek an email with a link that lets you book yourself into my calendar rather than us having to spend half an hour or multiple emails going, well, are you free on a Tuesday? Yes, I'm free on a Tuesday, but not after two o'clock. Okay, how are you before two o'clock? I can just send you a link. You can find your own spot and book yourself in. You can see when I'm free and you just go, yeah. yep, I'll have that spot, thank you. <clears throat> Such systems are um, Calendly is a very popular one. Um, so it's like calendar, but rather than the AR at the end, you have LY. And the one I use is you can book me. There are plenty of others, including one by Zoho. Um, calendars are absolutely awesome. This is a bit of an old screenshot, but you can see there on the side, I have multiple calendars listed down the side and my calendar there, this was back in 2016, was really, really busy. The yellowish ones were my jobs, the green ones are my daughter's, the blue ones are 4N, um, the red ones are ones that my wife had put on and the grey ones were things to do with social media so that I always knew what was going on. If there was a Twitter hour, I could join in. I knew which hour it was. If there was a 4N related thing, I could join in um, and all sorts. So I, was, I still am very much a calendar driven person. If it's not on my calendar, I don't do it. Whew. Durable drives. So what I mean by this is storage. So if you have a Google account, you've got 15 gig of storage online. You can use it for whatever you want. If you have a G Suite account, that is 30 gig, but of course you're paying for it. 
Uh, if you have Office 365, any version, you've got at least 1,000 gig of online storage. Zoho, you can buy 100 gig for about a pound 50. I can't remember if that's per month or not, but it's not expensive. Uh, it is more expensive than the other uh, contenders though. And the beauty is you can save your files to it and access them from anywhere. So you can have, let's say the Google Drive, you can have the Google Drive app on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer at home, on your laptop that you take around with you. And if you are out and about, you make changes to a file, you save it, it automatically gets saved up to Google. When you get home or back to the office and you open up your big computer, bosh, you've got the file already there. You didn't need to email it to yourself. You didn't need to mess around with the USB sticks. It's just always got the same version. They all synchronize with each other. Um, sorry, Grant, just a yes. quick question. Um, just now that you're talking about drives and so on, my problem right now is all these photos and videos that are on my phone and computer, et cetera. Any suggestions on- right, how uh, you, you phased out it then. All the files and folders are where? on my telephone and uh, my iPad and I'm, I'm run out of space on my phone so I need to get rid of it. Any suggestions on it? Okay. Um, Dropbox. Yeah, Dropbox is good. Um, OneDrive is good. Uh, Google have a, uh, a Google Photos app uh, where you can offload all of your photos and videos uh, at pretty much original quality and it takes up no space in your Google Drive. Um, it is a bit cumbersome to organize them into albums and stuff using Google Photos, but it's a brilliant way just to archive everything from your phone. Uh, once a month, you press the button that says uh, upload and delete from my phone. If you have an iPhone, you then have to go to the, the Apple Photos app and delete them again, but then they're on Google Photos. And you know, obviously check that they are on Google Photos before you delete them off your phone, because otherwise they are gone. Um, I think the easiest option is just to buy a bit more memory um, through Apple, isn't it? I, I pay 70, 79p a month and I've got like masses of memory on my phone now. Uh, you've got masses of capacity of, in your iCloud. Of capacity account. in the cloud, you sort of buy more memory in the cloud and you can just then yeah. keep it on your phone. Yeah, that way works as well. Yeah. Um, you do have to be careful sometimes. Uh, iPhones, if you set the automatic backup feature, for the iPhone itself, it takes up a lot of space in your iCloud account, and you may find that, find that if you're buying more space, you still run out of space quite quickly because your phone is taking backups of itself, not just your photos and videos. So sometimes you do have to be a bit wary with um, iCloud because it likes to do things all of its own accord. But yeah, absolutely, Sharon. Um, iPhone, if you have Apple devices everywhere, iCloud's a good solution because it just works. Uh, um, thing that I mentioned there, it's not a backup. Um, it can help though. Um, I would always recommend that you have an actual physical backup as well. So a, a plug-in hard disk that you plug into your computer, you run a backup and uh, you unplug it as well. But this online system is very useful as a day-to-day -day location that you have your files just all the time. Um, Beauty is you can also share documents and entire folders. So I've got a friend who lives in Taunton, um, or Bishop's Lydiard, and he is um, running the volunteer stuff there. Uh, and I've just walked him through creating a shared folder that he can email out to everyone. So anytime he has new resources, such as maps to show where these people are, you know, which houses they uh, are assigned to, to make sure that everything works nicely and uh, people have the correct shopping and stuff. He just, pops it in that folder and bosh, everyone's got it. Uh, you can, of course, control exactly what level of access people have. So he does not want people modifying these files. He gives them all read-only access. But if you are sharing with people that you trust and you want them to be able to modify the files, you can do that. Uh, if you are prepared to do so, you can even collaborate in real time. It's uh, So if you're doing spreadsheets or Word documents and things like that, you can have multiple people opening the document simultaneously. It can get quite confusing and it is certainly very different, but it's good fun. It's good fun to try it. Ooh, messaging systems. There are lots of them. So we're on Zoom. Uh, obviously Facebook has a messaging facility. Um, there are lots of other ones out there. Um, I would encourage people, if you are new to this and you don't have a WhatsApp or anything like that, try and use signal 
try and avoid using things like WhatsApp. Obviously, lots of people have WhatsApp, so sometimes it's quite difficult to uh, be the person that says, I don't have WhatsApp, I don't want it, I'm using Signal, can you use Signal too? But think about it, at one point, nobody else had WhatsApp. It's literally just, um, I don't like the term peer pressure, but everyone uses WhatsApp because everyone uses WhatsApp. If enough people start using things like Signal, then more people will use Signal. Uh, and I will cover the reason why I'm recommending Signal later when we look at the dark web. But there are plenty of tools out there that let you message with people in real time so that you can chat with them either video or text messaging which enables you to have constant contact with people but that's not what this one's about this one is about keeping your contacts in one place um, so you can organize them into groups like a basic crm so you can have a group for your clients you can have a group for your leads you can have a group for your hot leads people are desperate for your thing but they haven't actually signed up yet and you don't have to necessarily use any fancy systems. You are literally just adding them to a list in your contact system. Um, this actually really annoys me. Even today, I still see on Facebook people going, I've got a new phone. I don't have any of my phone numbers. Please message me. Here's my phone number. I'm thinking, for goodness sake, you've been able to synchronize your contacts list on your phone with something like uh, Outlook or Google or iCloud for 16 years why are people still not doing that and and getting to a situation where we go oh my phone went swimming i now have to put all of my contacts back in just use a, a cloud syncing thing or even just you know your computer so that you can plug your phone in press a button and all of your contacts get synchronized again something though that is quite useful for these most uh, contact tools allow you to take photos of people and store them as that contact's photo. Take a photo of their business card. That way you've always got their business card in front of you. To-do lists. So keep a copy, sorry, keep on top of your to-do lists from all of your devices. So it doesn't matter whether you've got your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your computer. You can go, yep, tick, I've done that one. Um, check them off as you do them wherever you are and you get a lovely hit of dopamine every time you swipe away a completed task so you don't necessarily have to write stuff down a lot of people get hung up on oh I have to write it down otherwise it doesn't feel like I've done it it's not the writing that does it it is actually the scrubbing it out the ticking so if you find an app uh, I use uh, just google tasks to be honest with you um, you can literally swipe it away when you've done it and you get that same hit of dopamine you feel good when you've done it rather than just you know tapping a screen you are getting rid of it and it's gone um so google have one uh, there is also trello which i will mention another time later trello is fantastic it is a to-do list on steroids um, and you can do a lot with it not just to-do lists oh i've just said that to do with with bells on Whew, mapping systems so you can create maps with your own pins and um, put them wherever you want. So a lot of people get, oh, that's really nice. You've got a good map on your website. You can create your own. All you need is a Google account. You can embed them on your own website. So this is a map that I took recently of places where I have de essentially delivered exactly this talk around the country. I can add my own pins to that. I can share that in uh, on my website. I, that's editable. I can do what I want with it. So maps are really, really useful, particularly if, let's say, you've got um, multiple locations that you work from. People might want to know where they can find you. Have it with multiple pins on your map. You can change the color. You can change the icon. You can do tons with it, all from your Google account. Rattling through. There's a lot to get through on here. Phones. Get a smartphone. There's a very good chance you already have one. With a smartphone, you can take everything with you all the time. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a top-notch phone, and you can buy them secondhand for about 40 quid, and they will do what you need. They are good enough. Um, you can get SIM-only deals with unlimited data for about 10 to 15 pound a month, depending upon where you go. Uh, so there is no reason that you can't have all these things on all the time and do video messaging anywhere for not a lot of money. Chances are you actually already have one. 
You just need to make more use of it. Don't be shy of using your phone for stuff. They are phenomenal devices. So carrying on with that, something that a lot of people don't realize, most voicemail providers will delete your voicemail after a given period, even if you have not listened to it. So a lot of places, uh, Vodafone for instance, if you've listened to voicemail, it will keep that voicemail for seven days. Obviously, if you go back in and listen to it again and say, save this voicemail, it keeps it for another seven days. But if it's something that you really need to keep as an archive, do you want to keep going back in every six days to listen to the message and say, keep it for another seven days, please? If you've not listened to a message, it will be deleted after 31 days. You can change who handles your voicemail. I use a product called InstaVoice. They never ever delete messages and I can listen to them on my phone, my tablet and on my computer, online, anywhere I like. All it takes is that you run a bit of pro, uh, you run an app on your phone, it does all the hard work in the background and when someone calls me and they get sent to voicemail, it costs me my minutes, but I have unlimited minutes on my contract, so it costs me nothing and I never have to delete a message. I have messages going back to 2009 because I'm a hoarder. Right, take landline calls wherever you are. You can use a virtual landline. Keep your business and personal phone numbers separate. So if you do have a landline number, it's not your actual landline that's ringing and you don't have your kids answering the calls. It will be on your phone or you can have an actual desk phone. I have one here. It's, a, it's called a voice over IP phone. It runs all through the internet. Um, £20 call credit can easily last all year if all you do is use it for incoming phone calls and you use your phone, your mobile, for outgoing phone calls. Um, if you are a sole trader, you can even get these uh, phone numbers for free because you sign up for it as a residential client. There's a lot of um, gray area when you're a sole trader. If you are a limited company, then they do charge you a monthly fee for it, but they're not expensive. And beauty is you can have one from anywhere in the country. So I'm based in Plymouth. I do have a Taunton phone number that I don't give out to people because everyone has my Plymouth number. Um, and you can make it so that if you are busy and you can't take the call, you can always forward it on. Whew. And forwarding it on to an answering service. So if a potential supplier is calling you, or when you are calling a potential supplier, who are you going to go back with? Are you going to go back to someone who has a BT1571 number? Or are you going to go back to someone who has a Welcome to Tesco Mobile? Or are you going to go back to someone who you couldn't get hold of, but an actual person answered the phone? It sounds like they've got a secretary. Yeah, they're interested. They are a good business to take my money. So I use a service called answer.co.uk. Every time they take a message, it costs me a pound. If I don't use them within a month. Oh, yes. Hello, Phil. What's your view on chatbots, um, Grant? Because they seem to be coming into the mainstream more and more and more people are using them. What do you think of those? I have absolutely no problem with them. So long as the people who set them up make it abundantly clear that you are talking to a chatbot. Okay. I find that a lot of people uh, get a bit uppity if they find that all this dialogue that they've been having with someone wasn't a person, it was yeah. a, a software. So as long as you are upfront and say, hi, I'm a bot, I can help you, what do you need help with? Yeah. Then bots are fine. I, I set them up for people sometimes. Okay. They're, they're yeah. quite complex, but they're, they're pretty good. They're pretty good. Um, but yeah, answering services, I would say definitely you should get one of those. As if I gave you one bit of business advice, it would be get a bloody answering service. Right, spam. Whew. MailChimp. There are plenty of other things like MailChimp, which allows you to send spam, um, sorry, uh, messages to your clients. Um, you can run these campaigns from your phone. I actually have um, several clients set up on my phone so that I can monitor their systems. Uh, I've been teaching them how to use it, but sometimes they, they still want me to go and check, have I done this correctly? So I've got it set up on my phone so that I can keep an eye on it and help them where needed. Uh, with MailChimp, it is 
the most common one out there. For free, you can have 2,000 subscribers and you can send up to 10,000 messages per month without having to pay them a penny. Mm -hmm. So if you've got 2,000 subscribers, you can send each one of those subscribers five messages in a month. That's a lot of emails you can get out. Obviously, if you have less subscribers, you can send more messages out per month as long as you are staying within 10,000 within a month. There is no reason not to be able to send emails to people, mass marketing emails, or even just keep people keeping up to date with what you're up to. Which leads on to the social side of things. Um, engage. Engage your social networks and social media everywhere. Automate some of your activity. So plan ahead and use tools that are, which will post out on your behalf. The I'm saying some of your social activity. Try not to automate LinkedIn stuff. Uh, LinkedIn are really finicky about this. And if they get wind of the fact that you are um, automating your, your posting on LinkedIn, they will just close your account, no questions asked. Um, so don't automate LinkedIn if you can get away with it. Uh, use your apps on your phones, tablets, laptops, computers, whatever, to continue the engagement. It's all very well posting to your Facebook page and posting to groups. But if people then start engaging with you and you swanning off and never come back to them, their interest is going to wane and you're, you're doing it for no reason at all. So you post using automation on social networks, but continue the engagement in person. And you'll know when somebody engages with you because it'll ping a message on your phone or in your email. So you just need to make sure that you are responding to those. Um, as I said, it costs nothing but your time. So payments. Oh, I forgot to do this one, but at a point in time. Um, so you can take credit card and debit card payments right from your phone without any extra tools using various things such as PayPal here, Square, iZettle, SumUp. I used to have a PayPal here account. I don't anymore because my device broke and they wanted to charge me 120 quid for a new one. So I bought Square instead, which actually works a lot better. Um, so literally I just charge up my device um, attach it to my phone or Bluetooth it to my phone and I can take chip and pin payments or I can take contactless. Um, I can take payments wherever I am. It sits in my bag at all times. So you don't necessarily have to uh, have complicated and expensive systems. Obviously, if you have a high volume of card based transactions, be that chip and pin or contactless or whatever, it is worth going to an actual merchant. But if you have a low volume of transactions, it's worth just getting something like Square and setting it up. It is more expensive. The commission essentially is more expensive per transaction, but you have far fewer of them. So it's it swings and roundabouts, but for a low volume of transactions, I would say Square uh, is one of the leaders at the moment. Oh, CRMs. Wonderful thing about CRMs is that you can access them from anywhere and you can do what you want with them. So you it's basically it takes the idea of keeping everything in your contacts list and it makes it a little bit more businessy so that you have um, leads and you can convert your leads. But all you're doing really is keeping a track of the people that you speak with. There are plenty of them to choose from. Um, they all have pluses and minuses. Uh, bear in mind that a CRM has only two things that it needs to do. It needs to be able to categorize your contacts so that you can see this person is a lead, this person is not a lead, this <coughs> an existing customer. So you categorize them and you keep track of your engagements with them. Those are the only two things that make a CRM a CRM. Anything else is a bell and a whistle. It's a nice to have but all CRMs will have those two features, categorizing and um, tracking your, your contact list. I am currently using Zoho. Uh, I have used Capsule, Ag Agile, Insightly, Bitrix24, which is weird, uh, HubSpot and Trello, which I said is a to-do list, but you can use it as a CRM if you're wily. Um, would, would you include Slack in that list, Grant? Uh, I would say Slack is more to do with uh, a messaging platform. Uh, so obviously you, you do have contacts in there and you can uh, sort of categorize them, but it's, no, I would say Slack is more like an instant messaging platform with bells and whistles on it. Okay, thank you. 
but you can tie Slack in with all these other things if you want. Yeah. So accounting. Keep it on top of your accounts from anywhere. Before you go on, I yes. understand. I understand that you can download from uh, LinkedIn all your contacts in LinkedIn. I, I don't know if you've realized that or yes. you've done it before or whatever. But it seems like now, of course, you can't download the emails. Is there a way to download the emails that you're aware of? Um, I believe if uh, you can download their emails, but it depends upon what they have set up. So uh, if I went to my LinkedIn account and went into the settings and said, do not let people download my email address, even though we are connected on LinkedIn, you would not get my email address from it. But a lot of people don't know how to do that. So if you go and download it, you will still get their email address. But you might not have, you might not do it through the contacts, but you might have to go and do it from a export all of my data and it dumps out as a, a big old spreadsheet. Mm. Um, so there are plenty of accounting systems out there that are free to use. Most of them are ad supported, but they do make it in the small print clear that the adverts are not based on your content. So they are not sharing the content of your invoices and stuff like that with third parties. It is purely uh, an advert um, like you see on the TV. Um, I have used Wave. I have used Brightbook. I've been using Quickfile for about five years now, and it's absolutely bloody brilliant. Um, and it costs me the princely sum of nothing per month. And it's got 85, 90% of the features of um zero and the other ones like zero it's it's good it's not exactly the prettiest of things to look at but function wise it's fantastic oh i remember what mammoth memory was now it's about note keeping is that an open source uh, software is it then uh, no it's not open source i do use things a lot um but um quick file it's just a free website okay um, so the map, don't forget anything. So if you're out and about, take a note, take a snapshot, jot it down, take a photo, record it in whatever way you want on your phone, tablet, device, whatever, and it will synchronize everywhere so that you can access it on any of your devices. You never have to forget that brilliant idea you had because you didn't happen to have something to hand. So even on Android, you can uh, do a send to so if you find a website and you think, that's brilliant, I must remember this, you can share it and send to Google Keep, send to Apple Notes, send to, I use Simple Note actually, uh, Evernote. But it's, it's just a, a single note-taking platform that you can use on all of your devices. Which brings me to this actually, Feedly. Um, a lot of places have blogs. Uh, so you can keep an eye on your competitors by keeping up to date with their blogs. You can keep an eye on your suppliers by keeping up to date with their blogs. Ideally, you want people to be coming to your blog. So what I would recommend to people is that they use something like Feedly, which aggregates so you can add lots of people's blogs to Feedly and you go to one place to look at them all. Rather than six or seven different websites to see if there's any new things, you go to Feedly and it will tell you that... That, that person has posted a new blog. Read it, digest the content, and then create a blog post of your own around that content. Can and then share that content out on social media. Can I ask a question around that? So could you use Feedly? Uh, yes, certainly. Sure. Could you ask use Feedly as a marketing tool? In other words, you get your blog onto Feedly so other people see it? Or not? I... Well, Feedly is literally just an aggregator. So if if you wanted to follow my blog, you could add it to your Feedly. Right. Okay. Okay. The same way. Uh, does anybody listen to podcasts? You podcaster, the, Phil? The, yeah, the BBC one sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can go to the BBC and listen to their podcasts. Yeah. Or if you've got an iPhone, you'd load up the podcasts app, and that will connect to other places to get those podcasts so you might have you might have subscribed to three or four podcasts but you're not going to those three or four websites you go to the podcast app to listen to them all right okay does that make sense yeah feedly Thanks. is the same so you go to the feedly app 
to uh, follow up on these blogs. But right. the point I'm making is digest the content and then regurgitate it. Create your own blog posts about the same content. And then you go and share your blog post out through your social media, out through your MailChimp, so that you are getting people to come to you for news. It doesn't matter for the fact that it's second, third or fourth hand news. They might not have gone to the original source. They will come to you for it. You are now the authority. Um, send to your notes. Yep, I think I've covered all those. So events, Eventbrite. There are plenty of others, but basically you can create an event uh, and they will handle all the payments. You can manage it and uh, do what you want with it all from one place, from your web, from your uh, computer, from your laptop, from your phone. You can manage it because it's all in one place. Um, Eventbrite is the sort of the lead on this at the moment. I used to use um, one. But for instance, uh, I, you could have created an Eventbrite event for this, Linda. I did, actually. I did do that. Yeah. I set it oh, up. I I'm not that. sure. I, I didn't I link did it with this, though. So I don't know. If you, I, are you saying you can link it with Zoom? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely you can. Okay, well, you'll have to tell me how to do that then. <laughs> Sorry. When I, when I was running my <laughs> monthly coaching, I used to use uh, one called Splash, which is a free one. Have you used that? Come across that one? I have not come across Splash. Um, as I said there are lots of them out there. Um, Eventbrite just happens to be the one that people know. The nice thing about Splash is it's got you can you can um, you can create lovely graphics and pictures and images. It's a, it's, it's got a lovely graphic uh, library that you can use for your event. Um, so worth having a look at Splash if it's still still going. I haven't used it obviously since I. Uh, Make a note, hang on. A bit of paper. It's called Splash. Right, I've just written Splash equals event, right? I'll have a look at that later. Okay. Thank you, Phil. You're welcome. Right. Um, if you are paying, if you're setting up so that people have to pay for your event on Eventbrite and most others, um, they will handle the cash. Uh, and they take a percentage of your ticket price, and that's more or less it. Um, groceries. So this is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek one. You can go and have your partner adding things to your shopping list whilst you are actually in the, the shop. Um, it's just a, a, a little tongue-in-cheek thing, so that every, you can have everything everywhere, basically. And then managing it all. This is where emails come down to it. Pretty much all of these things can notify you via email. What you need to do is set up rules or filters so that your email system puts them into folders on your behalf. Otherwise, you will end up swamped with notifications into your inbox. Um, but use this to your advantage. I personally have a filtering system where it filters out everything into folders. And it only filters, or rather it filters in everything into folders. So all of my social media notifications go into the relevant place. Facebook stuff goes into Facebook folder. Twitter things go into the Twitter folder. LinkedIn notifications, God only knows how many hundreds of those you get. LinkedIn love to email you. They go into the LinkedIn folder. So that I'm only left with stuff in my inbox, things that I wasn't anticipating, things that might be urgent, or emails from people that... Um, actually, I need to jump on this now. So Linda, if you were to email me now, it would end up in my inbox rather than into one of these folders because I haven't filtered stuff yet. But it's, it's yeah, a great way to email you more often then, I guess. Grant, <laughs> Hello, me yes. Grant could, you, could, you, uh, could you run us through how to set up uh, folders on, on Gmail then, briefly? Okay, Gmail has what's called labels, but you can treat them as folders um, and I can probably show you now if I drag that one over here. So you go to the cog in the corner. Yeah. Into settings. Yeah. We're seeing Phil. Go to the filters. We're seeing Phil, not your screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, just about. Yeah. Then all the way down. The, sorry, I have quite a high resolution screen. All the way down the bottom on the filters and blocked addresses, you have create a new filter. 
And what that does is it brings up the search box and you, you use the search term. So, um, Linda, what's your email address? Post at beckandcall.uk. Beck yeah. okay. Yeah. So I could, if, if it's come from post at uh, beckandcall.co.uk, and then I create the filter, so it searches for those emails, and then the next bit is where do I want to go? Now, if you skip the inbox, it will not go in your inbox, it will just go into the folder. But to put it in a folder, you apply a label to it. So I could say, new label, Linda. If I cl click create filter, that's it done. It's like three steps. That's good, that's good advice, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, how do I get back to, there it is. Oh, that couldn't, didn't crash with really. it. There we go, managing all. So yeah, um, filtering. Uh, some people filter in, some people filter out. As long as you are filtering so that you are not inundated with the emails, it doesn't matter which rule you take. Um, the key thing is to know about where you are creating these rules. Um, if you are using something like Gmail or Hotmail, then the email rules are done at the server. So it, it just happens in the background. If you have an old school email and you're using something like Thunderbird or the Mac Mail app or something like that, the rules happen on your computer. So if you've got the same email account set up on multiple devices, only one of them will have the filters running. So you may still end up inundated with the emails until you turn your computer on you might have to go to the server, uh, going to your webmail or something like that to set up the rules so that they run there uh, and they are they filtered at the server rather than on your device. Um, but if I'm more than happy, if ever you've got a question about these things, just jump on, give me a shout and I can talk you through it and help you with it. It's not a problem. Um, right, <clears throat> but wait, there's more. If you start getting a taste for doing things yourself, there's a lot you can do. Um, you've got a smartphone, you can do videos. You can do voiceovers. Uh, you can add music later using free tools such as iMovie, Windows Movies. Um, you can add free music. Uh, YouTube have in their YouTube studio an audio library, absolutely rammed full of music that you are free to use. Sometimes you have to put a little attribution in there to say that it's come from the YouTube library. Sometimes you don't, depends upon which one it is. Um, but I would always say, even if your plan is to outsource it to um, a third party expert, such as I can see Jack is online here and he's a brilliant video person. Even if your plan is to outsource it, have a go at doing it yourself so that you've got an idea of what he is you want to get out of it. So that then when you are talking to the expert, you can say to them, I would like a video that looks a bit like this and does that, but I want it to be better than the one that I've created. Thank you very much, Jack. Right, and that's it on the uh, tech for traders bit. There's a lot there. I don't expect you to have taken it all in um, because it's very fast paced uh, and that's it. Do we have any specific questions on that? And how are we doing for time, Linda? Uh, well, <laughs> the time is pretty much marched on considerably. So I, I'm happy to stay on. If people are happy to stay on to hear the dark web talk, that's great. Um, we were hoping to end at 12.30, but... I have I'm no idea what the time is. Sorry? I have no idea what the time is. I can't see a clock anywhere in here at the moment. It's 12.23 at the moment. Ooh. So, Sorry. <laughs> so I think we're going to go over, but people are, you know, I'm happy to stay on because this is quite interesting and helpful. So that'd be great. Oh, we've lost somebody. Oh, we've lost someone, have we? <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said you can leave, <laughs> but um, I don't think Jack wants to just go over uh, who he is because we did do a bit of a round. I don't know if Jack, you're hearing us, but um, did you want yes, to? Yes, I'm hearing you. Can you hear me? I yes. can hear you, Jack. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Jack Carey. I run the video production company called JC Video, which is uh, based in Devon. Um, we work worldwide on a, a number of, of projects. Uh, we work with, with all size businesses as well. And as of recently, I've set up a, uh, 
a video production online course for exactly the reason um, that, uh, that's just been stated of uh, basically getting to grips with how um, individuals uh, and individual businesses can use video production uh, for a lower budget and start producing their own materials without having to pay professional prices. Um, so that's me, that's Jack Carey at JC Video. Thanks, Jack. Um, so in terms of questions, I had a question. Um, yes, sorry. Again. I, I wanted to ask about CRM system. Is there one, I know you, you said a few, but is there one that you would sort of really recommend? There's two. There's two that I really recommend. Uh, and for different reasons. I really like uh, Insightly because it integrates beautifully with, actually, I'm going to make that three. It integrates beautifully with Gmail. And a lot of small and micro businesses, I find they, they don't necessarily want to pay uh, at the ends of the earth for email hosting and what have you. So I set them up with a Gmail account and I tie in their domain emails with that and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so having a system that just works from where they are is brilliant. Um, so Insightly is really, really good. Downside of Insightly is it's got quite low restrictions. So um, you can only have like 500 contacts and that includes companies. So if I'm creating a company of beck and call, that's one contact. If I add Linda Humphreys to that, that's two contacts for the same person. So you end up with quite a small number of contacts in it before you actually have to start paying them. What's that one called, sorry? Insightly, I-N-S-I-G-H-T-L-Y. Oh, okay. Um, another one that I really, really like because I am a, a diehard Google user is Streak, Streak CRM. Um, it is, it, it doesn't have its own interface. It, it's an add-on to Gmail. So everything happens within Gmail. You don't have to go somewhere else to, to manage your lists. It all happens in Gmail. Um, and I really like them because they have uh, an email tracking facility. So if I send an email to you, Derek, I can tell when you have opened it. Right. Now, a lot of people go, well, you can do that anyway with your red receipts. You can, but with red receipts, the, the recipient actually has to agree to it. They have to say, yes, I want to send a receipt back saying I have read it. With this tracking facility, they don't. It tracks the fact that you've opened it. So I can tell, hello, he's opened his email three days ago and he still hasn't got back to me yet. What's going on? Um, and the third one is Zoho. Zoho is so unbelievably customizable. You can do whatever you want with it. But unfortunately, with that customization comes uh, complexity. So a lot of people, when they first sign up with Zoho, it, it's overwhelming because you, you have to customize it before you can really make good use of it. The default settings are not good for most people. But if you spend just a couple of hours customizing it, I know that sounds a long time, customizing it for two hours, um, it is a beautiful, beautiful system. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a quick question of Jack? Jack, have you got a website that I can go to? Uh, yes, I have a website. Uh, the website is uh, www.jcvideo.co.uk. Okay, thank you. I would definitely recommend going and having a look at Jack's stuff and having a chat with him if you're interested in video. Uh, his stuff is absolutely top notch. Right. Thank you, and uh, and thank you for. Uh, I apologise for my uh, uh, my tardiness. It's uh, I was having technical issues. It turned out I've been doing this on my phone, and um, the link that Zoom sends you, um, the button doesn't work quite right on the phone. So I was trying my hardest to try and, uh, all manner of things, trying to download the app and do all that type of thing. Turns out if uh, if you display it in the right resolution, it works just fine. So apologies, but good, good. From what I caught of the talk, and I, I caught about an hour of it, really good. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for coming, Jack. Thank you. Right, I'm, I'm happy for you to move on when you're ready, um, Grant.
Okay. Um, everybody want me to move on to dark web stuff? Yeah. Yes. I've got 10 minutes okay. time left. Sorry. Yeah. It's the reason I'm here. Okay. Fantastic. I will. Where's my bloody presentation gone? I keep losing it. I have literally about 70 icons, really, really small ones across the bottom of my screen. There we go. So, dark web. What is the dark web? Um, before we get into that, we need just first a little primer on how the internet actually works. Because otherwise, it doesn't really make sense as to why the dark web even exists and how it exists. So normally, you would go to things like www.google.com. We use names. Computers do not like names, they like numbers. So the numbers for google.com is 216.58.204.4. Uh, but obviously, computer actually sees it in binary, so it'd be 101, all that at the bottom there, which is really small, even for my screen. Uh, but computers like numbers. So in order to convert from a name to a number, we use something called a DNS server. So a DNS server says, what IP address should I use for Google.com? Your computer will first look at its local cache to see if it's ever connected to it before. If you've connected to Google recently, it will just use the same IP address that you used last time. If it hasn't connected to Google recently, the next thing it does is it asks, well, Google, is my, is my name Google.com? If your name is not Google.com, it then looks at what's called your local host file that says, is there anybody that I'm directly connected to called Google.com? If it's not in any of those three places, if it's not in your cache, it's not your own name, and it's not in your host file, then it will ask your DNS server called a resolver Usually, that's your router. So if your DNS server, your router, doesn't know who it is, in actual fact, your router will then go and ask your ISP. So if your ISP doesn't know who it is, it asks the global DNS route, rootservers.net for .com domains. Uh, rootservers.net says, hmm, it ends in .com. So you need to ask the global TLD servers. TLD stands for top level domain, which is dot com dot co dot uk dot net dot info so the global tld servers say yes we have an entry for google.com but we don't know where it is all we're told is you have to direct the, the question to google's own name servers which is nsx.google.com and finally nsx.google.com will come back and say yep we know www on google at com their number is this, 216.58.213.4. Once you've got that number, your computer can talk to them. And that happens in a split second. Another example, one a little bit more personal to me. What IP address should I use for brightology.co.uk? So if your DNS server does not know, this would be your ISP most likely, then it asks the global root servers. Global root servers say, it's a, dot, it's a dot UK address. You'd best go and ask the country code top level domain service for the UK, because it's a dot UK. They say, we have an entry for Brightology and it's registered with the 123 reg. Go and ask them. 123 reg say, yes, we registered Brightology, but they're not using our name server. They're using LCN's name servers. Go and ask LCN. LCN say, yep, we have www on brightology at .co.uk. Their number is 94.126.40.42. Once you've got that number, your browser can connect to my website and it works. And it works in a split second. So we need all of this thing so that we can translate names into numbers because computers don't like names. It's all very good, but how does this relate to the dark web? There are a lot of top level domains. As we saw in the previous presentation, there are tons of them. So this is even more than in the list that we had last time, because this includes things like Chinese names and addresses and uh, Arabic names and addresses. In fact, currently, as of last week, there were 1,578 endings for domain names. So I could have brightology dot whatever I wanted at the end within reason, excuse me. But there is no dot brightology yet. So I couldn't have website dot brightology. 
I would have to have website dot pritology dot something. I've already said that. I can have something dot pritology dot code uk, but I can't have website dot pritology yet. Unless actually I change the system I use. So normally if my ISP doesn't know the, the, the numbers or the names or addresses, it doesn't know anything about it, it goes and asks someone else, it asks the global root servers. But if I so stop using my ISP, if I change who the first person I ask is, and I change it to someone like OpenNIC, then there's lots of other domains available to me. So with OpenNIC, I can have .bbs, .libre, .neo, .parody. At the bottom there, it's not necessarily easy to read, it says, if I have a top level domain idea, anybody with the right experience can apply to run their own top level domain, an open NIC network. So with open NIC, I could have dot brightology. And because open NIC, the way open NIC works, it actually wouldn't cost me anything. But you may notice there is a dot geek. I like the sound of that one, as people who know me will know. Dot geek would fit me very nicely. So I could have Brightology dot geek. Indeed, at one point, about two years ago, I did register Brightology dot geek. And Brightology dot geek existed for a brief while, but only if you used OpenNIC. So if you went to Brightology dot geek and you were using OpenNIC, you would see a website. Didn't have anything on it. I did it purely because I could. If, however, you were not using OpenNIC and you continued to use your ASP and they used the global root servers, then you would see, I'm sorry, this website cannot be reached. It says here, err name not resolved. So .geek is not found. It can't be used. We are now in the territory of the slightly grey web. So we're not in dark web territory yet. This alternative DNS stuff, all it allows you to do is have websites that are not recognized by normal DNS services. It still works perfectly well and you can access normal DNS from it. So if I was to change who I ask from my ISP to open NIC, I would have access to all of these other domains as well. And if it isn't one of them, it, it defaults back to open it, uh, asking the global DNS route. So I could still get to all the normal websites as well. They're not hidden, all these extra domains. They're just out of view, as it were. So it's not dark web. It's not dodgy or anything like that yet. It's just not the mainstream stuff yet. So next up with looking at stuff called routing. Now you have a router, okay? You might think of your router as something a bit like one of those. You've got one in your house, it connects you to the internet. I think of routers, because I used to teach Cisco, I think of routers like this. Big boxes that do lots of heavy lifting, stuff like that. The whole point of a router is to route internet traffic from one place to another avoiding dead links and avoiding loops. So your router at home has one job. It takes the traffic from your uh, network at home and shoves it out onto your ISP's network. And if there is stuff that comes back to you, so when you connect to Google, you are sending data to Google, it has to reply to you so that you can load a page. The ISP's job is to take all that traffic and make sure it goes to the right place, i.e. you. And it does that without having loops so that you don't have it going to A to B to C, back to A to B to C, back to A to D to C. It goes from A to B to C to D and you are D. All these routers manage this by talking to each other. They use what's called a routing protocol. So a router uses routing to route the web traffic. So it is literally like uh, the old school policemen in silent movies who are stood there directing traffic with their hands. That's what routers, the big routers do. They say, we've got traffic coming here. We can't send it down route A because there's too much going down route A, it's jammed. So we're gonna send it down route B because we know that it can still get to the destination. 
and they talk to each other so that they know which ones are jammed and which ones have stopped working and which ones have got problems on so that they're not routing traffic the wrong way. So here we have a little diagram of what's essentially the internet. So your computer is a green box on the side, server is the green box on the other side. All of the blue circles are routers and all of the lines are connections between them. A black line is a fairly quick connection, a red line might be a fairly slow connection, but they are different types of connection. So you have traffic, it goes to your router, your router says, where do I send it? Well, it sends it on to the only other thing it can do, which is your ISP's router. Your ISP sends it on, who sends it on, who sends it on, who sends it on, and eventually gets to the destination. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep, I see you're muted there, Linda, but I can see you nodding. Your route is actually very easily monitored. So I've just come off that screen, but if you spent enough time looking at it, you'd remember that that's the route it took. Anybody can sit on any of those devices or pretty much anywhere else on the internet and track your traffic. So it went there, it's gonna do that route again next time, unless something really nasty happens somewhere in the middle. So here is where we enter things called onion routing. This is definitely dark web territory now. <laughs> It's called onion routing because the traffic goes in to the core of the network and then back out again through the different layers and then back in again through the layers like an onion and then back out again like the layers of an onion. So same thing, but we've got more endpoints now. So we've got you is green and your destination is green, but we've got other devices which are gray. So with onion routing, it might go to that one, but then it will go back in and then go to that one. And then it'll come back in and it'll go to that one. And then it'll go back in again and it'll come to that one and it'll go back in and to this one and eventually gets to the end point. So it's taken a very, very roundabout route. It has gone into the internet and back out again. It's gone into the internet and back out again, but eventually it gets to the destination. And the whole point of that is to make it really difficult to track because anyone who's looking at your traffic doesn't necessarily know which one of those was the intended destination. It could have been any of them. Okay, so the question that a lot of people might ask is, well, what's wrong with tra tracking? Why is that such a bad thing? And that's a bad thing because of what's called metadata. Metadata is something that a lot of people really struggle to get their head around. I think, well, why does it matter that someone can see that the route through the internet that my traffic has taken? But if we extract that back a bit, and rather than saying my data, if we say, well, I'm using WhatsApp or I'm using Facebook Messenger and Facebook Messenger cannot see the content of my communication, because they use encryption, all they can collect is the metadata. And the metadata is where you were when you sent it, when you sent it, to who you sent it, when they picked it up, when they replied, etc., etc. That is metadata. Might sound fine if they track that, but how about this? They know that you rang a phone sex service at 2.24 a.m. and spoke for 18 minutes. They might not know what you talked about, but they know that you phoned. Would you be happy with someone knowing that you phoned a phone sex service at 2.24 a.m. and spoke for 18 minutes? They don't know what you spoke about. You could have been talking about groceries. It's quite unlikely. Would you be happy if someone knew that you called a suicide prevention hotline from the Golden Gate Bridge? They don't know what you spoke about. It's probably obvious what you spoke about, given who it was you called, but they don't know what you spoke about. The content was encrypted. All they have is metadata. All they know is who you spoke to, when and where. How about you spoke to an HIV testing service, then you spoke to your doctor, then you spoke to your health insurance company all within the same hour. We don't know what any of those conversations were about. I think the health insurance company might want to know about your metadata if you're going to be phoning HIV testing services and then your doctor. How about 
They knew you spoke to a gynaecologist for half an hour, and then you spoke to a local Planned Parenthood number later on that day. We don't know what the conversations were. All we know is that you spoke to these people. Metadata is important. It doesn't matter that it was encrypted and they don't know what it's about. You can infer very, very specific information. We don't know what the conversation was about. We just know that you're in the same WhatsApp group as known terrorists. Instantly, alarm bells start ringing. You're in the same group as terrorists. They are known terrorists. Maybe you are too. But we don't know the content of the message. I hope I'm impressing upon you that metadata is a very valuable resource that you don't necessarily want to be giving away to everybody. Metadata still sound fine to you? Doesn't to me. It does sound very complicated how to prevent all of this. It must be quite difficult to get into the dark web. It's actually surprisingly easy. And that's one of the, the downsides. Because it is so easy to get into the dark web, it's very easy for people who have, uh, shall we say, nefarious intents to get onto the dark web and ply their trade. Literally, all you need to do is go to torproject.org. There's a big purple button there that says download Tor. Obviously, if you're on a mobile device, it downloads a slightly different thing, but you still go to torproject.org and download it. They press the button, you download a bit of software, you run the bit of software. So this looks like a browser, but if you can see at the top in pink or orange, it says Tor browser, and we are running the Tor browser. It does all sorts of things in the background to make this onion routing work. You search for what's called the hidden wiki, and you load the hidden wiki and that's got links to all sorts of places. Now, the key things to take on here is notice the address ends in it's blah, 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 dot onion dot to. Dot onion websites are not available on the plain, boring, normal web. So this is clearly using a different set of DNS servers to make it so that you can see dot onion domains. So Euroguns, look at their website, 2kka4f23pcxgqkpv.onion. That does not exist on the light web. You can only get here on the dark web. And all it took was downloading an app, running it, searching for something called the Hidden Wiki, and clicking on three links. And you've got here, and you can buy guns or you can buy medical grade cannabis buds. Download an app, search for Hidden Wiki, click on three links, boom, you're here. It's not difficult to get onto at all. So is that all there is to it? Well, not really. You may have heard of something called WikiLeaks. If you try and go to wikileaks.org, they will not let you submit to WikiLeaks any documents on the normal web. So WikiLeaks is a service that lets people anonymously upload to them um, things that they think ought to be shared. So government informants who wish to tell the world that their government is doing stuff that it shouldn't be doing, upload stuff to WikiLeaks. You cannot get onto WikiLeaks to share information from the normal web. You can read information that has already been shared, but if you are a government informant and you want to uh, be a whistleblower and say, oi, notice that my government's doing stuff that's shady and here's all the evidence for it, you have to use the dark web to share it. And the reason for that is, if you are sharing it on the light web, on the normal web, people will know exactly who the hell shared it. Now, if you're in a nice country, what the worst that happens is you might go to prison. If you're in a nasty country and you are caught sharing stuff that you shouldn't, you probably just ended your life. <laughs> so WikiLeaks have done all they can to make it so that you are not able to share stuff through WikiLeaks unless you are untraceable. 
And I don't know about you, but I would not remember to go to rpzgejae 7 c blah, 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 dot onion. And I can't get to that through the normal web. But if you go to it through the dark web, here you go, WikiLeaks submission. You can upload files. You do not have to create an account. All you have to do is tell them what it is, what it's about, and they will look through it and check whether it's uh, worthy to be published on WikiLeaks. So that is a very short intro as to what the hell is Dark Web. Basically, it is a place where anything can happen, but it is very easy to get onto. It should not be somewhere that you are scared of. It is literally just the internet that is untraceable or mostly untraceable. Obviously, people are always coming up with new technologies to trace what you do on there, but then people are also coming up with new technologies to stop being traced. Have we got any questions about the dark web? Because I appreciate that that was quite a short overview. Well, I don't know if there's any questions, but um, definitely we, I think we should have you back to do a deep dive on, on more of this information, I believe. Um, I can give you a demo if you want right now. Uh, well, I think the time's really rushing on and people probably need to go. Okay. But I, unless I'm demo, go, Linda, sorry. It, sorry? I'm going to have to go. Yeah, that's why I'm okay. talking about. It was, it was nice to meet you, Phil. Um, nice, to meet you, Brad. Phil. nice meeting but, you too. If you've got any questions, feel free to text them, email, get in touch with me anyhow you like. Right. So, um, guys, good talk. Your things with us. Are you going to share your um, your presentation or? Uh, uh, yes, I can share that. I can make it uh, web accessible for you. Okay, good. And if possible, we'll have you back to just do a deep dive on some of the topics because you went through so many amazing things, mm. and, and I have. I'd like to know more information on some yes. of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anytime people, you like. People can Please. use your as mm. well. Jack had a question, I think. No, I'm saying that I'm, I'm going now. Thank you very much. It's been very enjoyable. Okay. Okay, well, nice to not see you again, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Now, I know. I know. No. All right, cheers, guys. I, mean, cheers. I will say, Grant, it was fascinating. It's uh, taught me how much I don't know and need to know, so definitely will be in touch with you sometime. And uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Linda, for organising it and having me on here. Yeah, you're quite thank you becoming Derek. Thank you so much. So um, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, we will definitely have Grant back to do a deep dive on some of these topics. So much appreciated. If you thank have you. any specific Enjoy questions. Enjoy the rest of the day. And I hope the rain stops for you all. <laughs> thank you, Derek. Thank you. Uh, if you've got any specific questions, I'm quite happy for you.